again. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and today, not in the studio, but over in England, we have Jock Coates, and he is a Georgist, an anarchist, an ex-counselor, and a land trust director in Oxford, United Kingdom, all of which I have to ask him about because I'm American and I don't understand other countries. He works in uh, higher education, technology, and as a warden in a student hall of residence, which I assume is like, oh my gosh, I need to ask you. You would all, call it a dorm. Means. Yeah, yeah, and so I already don't know what I'm talking about, but welcome. Thank you. Hi, Lucy. Um, interesting to be here. I, I, uh, as we were as we were talking about before we started, I. I thought my days of influencing anyone were, were over since I stopped writing a blog. So interesting to be here. Well, um, thought you were a man to talk to. So here you are. And um, well, there's a lot of stuff I'm going to poke at you about with Georgism. But um, first and foremost, what do you call yourself politically? How you got there, all that sort of thing. Yeah, well... I guess a little, a little bit like Kevin Carson recently, who's who's also decided to call himself an anarchist without adjectives or or whatever. Um, I think I'm gravitating the same way. So I mean, I I feel confident enough now to call myself just an anarchist, and then explain, you know, why that means I'm not dressed in black, throwing bricks through a bank window or or whatever. I think when I started all this. Um, when I got interested in this, uh, there was a sort of taint on the word anarchist, at least, you know, amongst, if you like, polite middle class political society. And so we went looking for, I, I, and, and I came to this really, first of all, through um, looking at house prices in Oxford and uh, mortgage debt and how the debt system, the debt money system worked. Um, because I mean, up until 1998, when I became a, a city councillor, I had been a pretty, you know, nondescript Liberal Party voting voter. I voted on the issues that, uh, you know, I cared about. Um, so LGBT. Such as, yeah, okay. Uh, bizarrely, uh, tax breaks for private schools, because I had been brought up by a family who was all over the world and so they sent me to a boarding school in England and you know forever for a long time and in fact I think they still do that the Labour Party for example would have wanted to close them down and tax them out of existence whereas really having been at 11 schools by the age of 11 my my boarding school was my first real stable community so the last you know so that was a big thing i didn't want to vote for them because they would close down that opportunity to people and things like that but uh, within weeks of tony blair being elected uh, prime minister in, in in the uk in 1997 i had decided to join the the uk's liberal democrat party and about well, about a year later, I, I found myself a city councillor in, in Oxford. And one of Oxford's biggest problems is house prices. You know, we are, for a long time, we have had, uh, you know, price to um, earnings, household earnings uh, ratios above 10 times, you know, things like that. So we're we're kind of almost in the in the Vancouver stratosphere of, of house prices. And so there had to be, for me, a, 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 a something about the structure of that housing market that caused those house prices. It wasn't simply supply and demand. Otherwise, we'd see you know hundreds of people on the streets every night rather than 10 or 20. So I went exploring house, housing and debt land monopoly and money monopoly um, and my first kind of big influence was a book called the grip of death um, which is what mortgage means it's, it's what it came from more death and gauge truly 
Yeah. Um, so, so in in um, never knew that. 13th century England and and France, presumably, mortgage was was a you 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 owed the money till you died kind of thing. So that was part of it. And on the other side of that, that you know, the mortgage is created by the banker. And it was interesting to find out where that, how that money then filtered into the economy and made, and never disappeared again. You know, so so fiat money growing through debt, it never really gets repaid. Uh, you know, the next buyer is taking out yet another mortgage to fill its space if somebody ends up paying it off. But um, some years down the line, it kind of that that kind of answers a lot of issues you know land has become if you like the new gold from which the goldsmiths used to manufacture their paper money by saying by having one pot of gold and you know 10 credits going out to the same value in the hope that nobody would come back and ask for the gold at the same time well in a sense in the late you know since perhaps Nixon or before then, you know, since the dropping of the gold standard in Britain or whatever, land had become that new that new gold. So if you look at some of the very biggest enterprises, some of the and, and some of the enablers of capitalism, the, the, the Goldman Sachs and things like that, I mean they kind of know two thousand and seven, eight apart, you know, that that um that they have this pile of money that can only ever grow, that on which they can base really stupid bets, like giving companies that produce a website a um, billion dollars on the basis that in twenty years' time they might turn a profit and it might all look very good. You know, mm-hmm. if we had to do that with our own savings, we you'd, you'd never see a Facebook or you'd never see a an Amazon or a or a Musk type sure, character. Yeah. Um, so it's all kind of become part of that that flow of funds from poor us, the worker, paying a mortgage or paying rent up into the banking system and thence into big capitalism. So where were we? Uh, um, yeah, so I had got interested in this because housing was such a big problem in Oxford. Mm-hmm. And um, in researching what to do about it i'd come across this idea and a, a couple of other councillors on the on the city liberal democrat councillors were members of the, the liberal democrat party's campaign group for land tax which you know has been go that particular campaign group is 25 years old but in the 1910s the liberal party in the united kingdom was the single tax party you know, it, it, it adopted land tax. Jo- John Stuart Mill was a fa- was a was a fan of land taxes, um, going back into the middle of the nineteenth century. When Henry George became popular, he did some international tours. He came to England, Scotland, Ireland, and had great success in public spe- speaking and things like that. Um, drew great crowds, and um, the Liberal Party put land tax as one of its four main principles, if you like, in about mid-1880s. So it's a long historical thing with with the Liberal Party in the UK, but of course the Liberal Party in the UK started to disappear after 1923 and has often been down at five or six MPs, you know, and Mm. then um, so it, so it, it, it itself has lost influence. But in the meantime, people in the party in in Britain have begun to, well, have, have largely forgotten that that was one of their USPs at one point. But but I had started to um, promote the idea as a, a as one way of perhaps helping to solve the problem with house prices in Oxford, and we'll get into that in a little while how it would do that, and then my. My um, my ward that that I represented mm-hmm. uh, did look on the map as if it was some kind of you know classic uh, 
US gerrymandered congressional mm -hmm. district. But re in reality, what it was was four little chunks of um, housing estates that had previously been in wards in the in the adjacent rural district councils, but were really part of city council estates. So they were tagged on the end, but they were too big to make part of the existing wards. So they gave, they created this ward out of four little bits around the eastern side of Oxford. Mm -hmm. So it was completely unique. And in, in, and in 2002, it was done away with. And I was faced with a choice of where would I like to stand? I chose the wrong one. The people of Oxford no longer wanted my services. And therefore, and so I was out. Mm -hmm. And I had been the chairman of a rather long-winded named economic and social well-being overview and scrutiny committee and the person who was taking over as chair after after i had been unceremoniously booted off the council wanted me as the previous chair to turn up to the first meeting just to you know to be there for some transition mm -hmm. Um, and so for the first time, I was sitting on the outside of a council meeting looking in. And I was just so depressed by what, you know, I always say that they were, they had met to talk about what they wanted to talk about next time they had a meeting to talk about meetings. And it was absolutely vacuous. Mm -hmm. And it made me think, you know, these guys have no clue what they're doing. They're really po politicians are useless kind of thing. Um, and so that's the day that I can trace, if you like, my wanting to be an anarchist. And when I say wanting to be an anarchist, I kind of, I went through various stages, even then of, of sort of learning how we could do without certain things. You know, I, I, I did want to be without without a state, but I couldn't see how we would get past welfare issues if we didn't have a state, let's say, or, mm -hmm. or policing issues, you know, uh, law enforcement and things like that. And my influences for those are, are just as um, dispersed and eclectic. I, I, I joined a couple of mailing lists. Um, in Britain, there, there, there used to be a couple of groups called the Libertarian Alliance, and they were quite active in the sense that they organized annual conferences with some quite interesting speakers and things like that. But they also maintained a, a, a quite well attended internet mailing list. So I, I joined that. And that's where I came across a, a character called Kevin Carson. Oh, sure. Um, on a UK Libertarian Alliance mailing list. And so I was kind of, I was reading as much as I could, you know, I, I, I picked up stuff from C4SS. I, I got into, uh, you know, Reason and Mises and FEE okay. and Independent Institute and, and things like that. Because there isn't, the, I mean, the Libertarian Alliance was a, a sort of two or three person band, really, in terms of productive output. There were, there, there wasn't, you know, it certainly wasn't as slick and managed as, say, Mises with annual conferences or academies or, or whatever. And so I kind of read widely, really trying to understand how bits of things might work. So a lot of the sort of analytical stuff that I picked up in, you know, Mises U podcasts or, or whatever, video casts on particular topics like how would we build the roads or mm -hmm. what about the, what, what about the oceans and the seas you know you can see Walter Block coming in there um, and um, why democracy is failing <laughs> and oh, dear. Hopper. forbidden triple H yes. yeah and and of course I didn't really know anything about the fan club that that that, that these guys had following them. Um, so I was just sort of reading avidly and interestedly, and I and and I went into the office one day, and we had an American guy who was a wobbly, um, and um, and I announced that I'm a libertarian, and he said, "Oh my God, you're going to be one of those right wing nut jobs like Ayn Rand, are you?" 
And I said, no. And I held up this book uh, called um, Studies in Mutualist Political Economy um, with freed market anti-capitalism across the top. Very good. And so that 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 suited him, but it but it it, it I mean I must admit I did find some of Kevin's um, larger stuff quite quite a difficult read without understanding the background of you know the 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 marginalist revolution and 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 things like that. Um, and whilst I wasn't a trained economist and I didn't have that economic history of you know knowing where or the the value theories developed and, and, and things like that. Um, so I found those quite difficult reads, but I equally read Kevin's stuff at C4SS, which was much more digestible and, and things like that. So, um, but one thing that I remember before, before I really settled into anything on my own was I, I, I said in this mailing list that I was, completely confused as to what I was you know I had read this I'd read that um can I be a Georgist and an anarchist and blah 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 blah. and Kevin said something like um there's more we agree on than than divides us and that got you know so even between Mises and C4SS there's more that that we agree Ooh, on I know. And divides us. And of course, a lot when of we, people who I know who would dispute that on either side. That's interesting. Well, I know, but equally, we are still all part of that 1% of the 1% who, who, who kind of, you know, so in a sense, I can see why one's um, preferred outcome might be completely different from the others. But in a sense, the the freeing up of society and of you know voluntary um, exchange in shaping that is what makes us different from the statists. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can still have left wing voluntary exchange people and right wing voluntary exchange people. We but and, and we probably shouldn't spend so much time arguing against each other and spend more time arguing against mainstream statist <laughs> politicians. You are not wrong. I used to be a little less interested in being annoyed by right-wing um, anarchists, but uh, and, and more recently, you know, um, Aaron Ross Powell, um, I think, has done some very interesting stuff more recently about trying to introduce what he perceives to be different groups in his audience to the other's ideas. So he's had sessions on Marxism and why, and you know, how that, how that led to certain outcomes or, or, or um, political outcomes. And it needn't have done, you know, it could have been a sort of free Marxism kind of thing. You know, the, the ideas of alienation and things like that are pertinent to left wing anarchists just as they are to left-wing statists and in fact what could be more alienating than being a um proletarian in the soviet union you know um you've got you've got some or in or in you know in yucca in 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 north korea you know you've got some um political semblance of being one of the one of the comrades but in reality some animals are more equal than others <laughs> you know so it did take me and bizarrely perhaps now as i look back it was a libert- the first time i ventured out to a libertarian alliance conference in london um they had this guy called hans hermann hopper and a guy called david friedman talking and doing presentations and as I say at this stage I I really had no idea about what whether and maybe British are more maybe the British are more polite about it or were more polite about it I mean certainly in in the halls of the National Liberal Club nobody was coming to fisticuffs over whether they were a Georgist or an an (laughs) anarcho-capitalist but quite clearly there were some Tory boys hanging around Hans Hermann Hoppe (laughs) <laughs> but yeah. but but actually it was his um it was his talk on um the private production of security which broke one of the big 
blockages, not taboos, but but you know, how do we get to a a stateless society if we don't have the state to 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 do law enforcement? So that was the first time that the NFD had tried to sort of show the mechanisms of mutual dispute resolution and things like that and why we didn't necessarily need the monopoly of violence to 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 arbitrate in things like that and then i got really interested in I, I, and i don't know what their history is and what their i, I gather they were they were objectivists but but um morris and linda Tannehill um and their uh, i forget what their the market for liberty them i don't think i recognize the name actually wow well actually i think i stumbled across them because ian what's his name from the um free state podcast um he had done an audio book of them uh, and i was very much into audio books at the time and in fact i i recorded a few um which might which will still be out there you know an albert j knock one and a Herbert Spencer one and a Bob Murphy one and a okay. Stephen Stephen Kinsella one. Oh Lord! Um, wow. Yeah, like, exactly. Familiar names. <laughs> um, so, um, so they had he had done a podcast of this market for liberty, and it and it goes. It's quite a big, wide ranging book, but it it really does try and explain quite well to me how markets and reputations and insurance and things like that can do so so they were the first ones who who really introduced me to the idea of a world without prisons you know Mm -hmm. in the sense that i mean okay we might still have a town which was largely an outlaw town because that's where the insurance company allow you know that's where people went to to rebuild their mutual credit if you like um before be, be, you know before proving themselves to be let back into their ex their old community but it, it would at least be you know non punishment it would mm-hmm. be um as i say rebuilding your credit worthiness if you like in a social sense so they were quite fascinating people like uh, the the big link i suppose was someone like albert j knock who um who was himself a, a Georgist was he? Um, and yet called himself, well, I think he called himself a new conservative, which I think at the time was really referring to um, a sort of right-wing libertarianism. But he's generally regarded as pretty much an anarchist, um, although he came from, you know, he, his, uh, his father was an Anglican priest and, and things like that. So quite a conservative background he was a fanboy of thomas jefferson and, and you know so he was but but him and a, uh, someone whom murray rothbard was great friends with later um frank chodorov were both georgist anarchists again before the before the world before the world knew of libertarians in the sense mm. of you know goldberg hadn't happened and things like that so albert albert j knock died in i want to say the mid 40s the mid 1940s um and his famous book our enemy the state was title. i suppose and that's one that i've done an audio book of so you might mm-hmm. find that online in various i haven't places. read that one no. well you can listen to it um, <laughs> maybe i will and that one definitely is available on the Mises website still. I'm sure, yeah. So he was kind of the first one that I had really come across who was saying how much worse it was to have a state. I mean, the theme is our enemy, the state, you know, mm-hmm. the existence of the state versus society being people working collaboratively together, but without overall imposition by Mm -hmm. a state you know he was the first one that really kind of showed how that arrangement of having a state could could be deleterious um so you know his his great his big example was the was the um now i can never i I never remember whether it's johnstown or jonestown the floods (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> as soon as you said that, it, Johnstown. Johnstown. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's nearby, a lot nearer than Jonestown was to so where it's I Jones, live. Jonestown is is where the oh no, Jamestown is where the where the first settlers arrived to. All right, we've got Jamestown, the first settlers. We've got Jonestown, the horror, the cult gone horribly wrong. Oh um, yes, oh yes. And, and then we've got Johnstown, which is where, where the, the flood happened. Right. That's about less than two hours from me, I think. Though I've never been up there. So Nock talks about <laughs> you know events like. Um, Events like that demonstrating the power of people voluntarily getting together, the amount of money that was raised Mm -hmm. to go into reconstruction there um, was far more than than a government would ever do, even with all the resources that FEMA could could muster, even though Mm -hmm. that didn't exist. And 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 you know, similarly, he he talked about how uh, you know before the New Deal and before government mandated um, employment insurance or social security or whatever you might call it, you know, bosses in general were less likely to lose, less likely to fire staff at the first sign of trouble because there was no other support mechanism. So just in terms of tugging the heartstrings, they were better at it. And as soon as you started to get unemployment insurance and things like that, people would just throw workers away because they knew that they could survive for a while on 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 government handouts. Um, and so part of that fabric, you alienated even more in the sense that you were no longer a part of a family business who would look after you even in a little bit of a downturn because they could get rid of you and somebody somebody else would pay the bill kind of thing and so it kind of demonstrated how that kind of social action if you like was much more effective than state action um, Mm -hmm. and less dividing than state action Um, because in state action it's obvious that one lot pays um, and one lot receives in a sense (laughs) whereas you know the idea of reciprocation and so on and that's where mutualism came into view and again, very naively, you know, I'd heard this word mutualism, and so I looked it up on the internet, and uh, I got Clarence Lee Schwartz's "What is mutualism?" And what is mutualism? Can you give us a little? Well, it's a, an elevator pitch for it, or whatever you. Call at it? the time, Kevin also called himself a mutualist. So, so you know, in a sense, he would be a more erudite. Um, answer, he would give a more erudite answer, I think. But for me, it it was, I suppose, less revolutionary than anarchism felt. Okay. Um, build the new society inside the shell of the old, you know. So don't don't go cracking eggs first. Get the you know, get get some of the key components built in so a little bit like um Samuel Conkin stuff agorism and and, and stuff like mm-hmm. that you know don't sure. don't worry about the structures don't try and overthrow the structures that 99% of the world believes in just try and show that your way is better before try before collapsing the the main thing so uh, and 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 quite a lot of that was you know, based around the mutualist ideas of people like Proudhon, Josiah Warren, um, William Batchelder of Green, who wrote about mutual banking um, and things like that. Uh, and so trying to replace some of the key, I want to say institutions, but not, not really institutions, ways of working. So things like the money system was the money system. You know, could we run on our own money if we wanted to? So I I spent a number of years, for example, trying to develop a local currency for Oxford. Oh, that's cool. In which we could get, for example, a, buy, a, a buy-in by all the colleges of the university. And so students would pay for their board and lodgings in cur- local currency because most of that money was staying in the local economy anyway because the colleges bought all their raw materials, all their food from local grocers and local butchers and, and so on, you know, or even local craftsmen involved in stone masonry and the buildings and, and things like that. So it would have been quite a nice pool 
of of um, of users, and you could persuade um, parents to pay pay into people's food accounts, knowing that it would be spent on whatever the Oxford dollar, the Oxford pound was spendable on, i.e., hall meals and not and not beer down the pub kind of right. thing. Unless, of course, you got a local pub chain to join, which would have been great. But yeah, so so I got involved in all those kind of eclectic little bits, and to me that that I mean mute. I mean, this is where we get into words that or names, pigeonholes that, as I say, you know, for such a small, relatively group of people who all probably share a belief in ultimately having no oppressors. Um, know if Hoppeites actually well i know right? <laughs> they just want really local artisanal oppressors <laughs> okay. artisan oppression yeah <laughs> but you know for us to get stuck on 99 different ways of describe words to describe ourselves is, is really it's true quite, uh, and and i had been getting you know I, I'm not really an anarchist. Am I a geo-anarchist? Am I a geo-libertarian anarchist? And there was one blog post in about 2000, and around the same time as I'd written that thing about uh, about Kevin, you know, where, when when he said there's more that, that unites us than divides us, you know, in truth. And I had come up with this phrase, geo-mutualist. And it's quite interesting because when I saw your list of things we wanted to talk about, um, I went off and typed it into Google, and there are, and I've not never been a really big redditor. I, I've been on there a few times, but it's quite interesting to see people asking, "What is geo mutualism?" and then all sorts of threads going off <laughs> explaining what it is. Well, it's whatever I say it is because I coined the word, <laughs> but nobody has ever asked. Um, and there was a guy in Texas called Will Schneck. He has well, I, 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 he's quieter now than he used to. But he he had a a blog called the Evolution of Consent. Um, mm. But anyway, he had, I think, I, either he had heard me use the phrase, or he had independently come up with it slightly later. And he was Will Schnack was much more into a sort of analysis of what those guys were writing. Um, whereas I had picked up my mutualism by listening, by, by reading, you know, fluffy stories about Glaswegian bakers joining the cooperative in what is mutualism <laughs> by, by Clarence Lee Schwartz. And so he ran off with the word geomutualism or geomutualist and started building a superstructure of philosophy on top of it. And, and, and so it's kind of difficult to know because although I coined the phrase and he agrees that I did, and unfortunately the the blog post evidence is now long gone, I think. Um, but but um, yeah, I mean, part of the part of the issue was anarchism and Georgism, do, do they really fit? Well, at the time I didn't I didn't really feel that they did in a sense. Um, and that was partly because of things like, um, so uh, Benjamin Tucker, I think, had been specifically anti-Georgism because, partly because they felt, and, and, and even, even right up to the present, um, so I've heard David Friedman say this as well, you know, the amount of rent in society is so small as a proportion of the economy as a whole, that to create a state-like structure to collect that rent as a land value tax is just not anarchist. You know, you you, you would just kind of ignore it and use it. And, and eventually when occupancy and use magically happens under our system, it won't matter anyway, anyway will it, kind of thing. And actually, I think that's wrong on, on a number of points, but perhaps we should sort of uh, before I get to that, we might want to look at what is Georgism as a, an, an idea or a, as a whole. There's a group, um, so the, the Georgists have their own, as usual, their own society, the Henry George Society and the Robert Schalkenbach Foundation in, in New York. And, you know, so people have given loads of money over the years to try and research these things. And there was a guy who wrote 
was the sort of main contributor for a while on a blog that they did called Progress Blog, called Fred Foldvery. And he was, uh, um, I want to say UC Davis professor, but it might not have been Davis, one of the UC network anyway. Mm -hmm. um, he was an economics professor there who called himself a geo-anarchist. He only, he only died at the, at the beginning of COVID sort of time, but he was pushing 80, I think, at the time. And he had participated in, you know, public choice theory discussions with Buchanan and people like that at, through Mises. Um, although I don't think he was ever particularly involved with Mises. It was in the same vein as they devoted a whole article, a whole monthly magazine to Kevin's writings at one point, didn't they, I think, and and had various people attack them and then allowed Kevin a rejoinder and things like that. So it was that kind of thing. But he was definitely convinced that you could be an anarchist and a Georgist and that, in fact, something akin to what we call in the mainstream land value tax would happen under under anarchism anyway because it doesn't matter whether you were under an occupancy and use system or a usufruct system or whatever, there would still be relative differences between people living in the heart of a very popular neighborhood and people living 100 miles away. And that kind of la that economy of land values has been known about for 300 years. Or, I mean, I keep thinking of the difference between the U.S., and the UK in terms of how much land there is at all and certainly how much unused land. I mean... Well, actually, it makes it more stark um, in, in the US uh, in the sense that, um, you know, here, land values outside of urban areas in total make up about 2% of the land value, even though they make up about 95% okay. of the land area. And that is an interesting point in itself, because if you look at agriculture and its associated trades um, as a proportion of the economy is about 2% of GDP. So, so, you know, the linking of land value to productivity is quite close, is quite, quite tight there. And so in America, it actually makes it even worse, because the fact that 99.9% .9 of your raw acres are, are in the middle of nowhere means that all of the trillions in land value uh, of the United States are in, well, the majority of them are in the big cities of the Northeast and the West Coast and Chicago. And you can see there have been, there have been attempts, there, there, there has been a, a hundred years worth of listings of land values in Chicago, which was, you know, one of the hearts of the progressive movement. And at the time, you know, Georgist politicians were in the running for political office in, in Chicago and things like that. And so there's been a, a long term project to map land values in Chicago, and it's being graphed on, on Facebook, uh, YouTube. And you can see that across the whole urban area, 99% of the land value is downtown mm -hmm. and in a very small area of downtown. And then it spreads out very thin. I mean, sure, maybe not quite as thin as the as the farmland 10 miles further out. But in general, you know, where people live <laughs> um, is very low value compared with the central business district and and that kind of area of and lake lakeside and and things like that in Chicago and and you can follow that throughout the world wherever they've tried to do that. So in the U.S., even of urban land values, I, you know, various figures. Are, uh, I'm, I'm plucking things out of the air now, but but you know, even for all the big cities in America, still seventy percent of the land value is in the New York metropolitan area, for example. And so it, it makes the, it makes the divide even sharper. If you happen to be, and sure, there is nothing wrong with the general principle from John Locke and people like that of how you acquire an interest in land, i.e., by settling it and working it. That was definitely going to come up as the 
this the idea that it's at odds with homesteading principles, which I never thought of as like a right wing thing, but I guess it's it's seen as such. It, it, it kind of is partly because I think you know the people who we would call propertarian um, libertarians all tend uh, tend to be in that camp. You know, the, the, and especially the ones on who for for whom property is the basis of order in society. So right, you know, right. by by attacking my property, you're attacking me, and that's great. You know, that kind of thing. But of course, when you talk about homesteading, you are talking about taking something unowned. And you know, in in the UK or. In Germany, when um, Franz Oppenheimer was writing The State, which was another big influence of mine, another libertarian who was a Georgist. Mm. So I think that was 1913. And at that point, he, he said, all of Germany is owned. And of course, it had been because, you know, um, and in England, you know, if maybe it wasn't owned up until K William the Conqueror came across, but he soon had it documented that all of that was his to dispose of and give away and, and reward his cronies with and, and, and things like that, regardless of who had it beforehand. So, you know, the fact that there may still be wilderness, like like especially those federally owned lands where a, a few years ago there were those farmers in Nevada that wanted to sure. remember that. Yeah. Lot. yeah, I mean, we have, I believe, is it Nevada, I think, maybe that has... It's seventy percent owned by the federal government. There's a couple of yeah. states where it's an enormous number. I know. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, the thing is, what it what is it worth to them? If 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 it doesn't yield a rent, then it then they're holding it for some other reason. It's not an investment, if you like. It's 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 there as a thing around which to structure other people's ownership or prevent people having access to it or or something like that. It's not. It's not really the same as BlackRock buying up all the housing on the market to 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 make money out of. You know, <laughs> it's it's a bit of a, a strange thing, and I can uh, you know perhaps there should have simply been a a better, clearer way of people being able to claim some of that because I imagine you know when they what's that Tom Cruise film where they go racing off Oklahoma to claim a stake in oh where they're irish and they have horrible yeah. irish accents yeah yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> far and away I far and away yeah. yeah so you know when that was going on the federal government had bought that and then di di divided it up hadn't they and right. said go and make claims on that well maybe there should have been a better way of saying you can go and make a claim but it's such a big country that you know the benefits of being co-located with other people whether it's for trade or for socializing or creative arts or wh whatever in cities are are fairly obvious not all of us want to live like the waltons in the middle of nowhere kind of thing and so if if i don't know a hundred years ago the extent of San Francisco's land value influence was 20 miles or something. And it, at, year, at, at mile 21, the land value tailed off to nothing because it was too difficult to get, you know, it was too arduous to get into San Francisco or whatever. And you homesteaded land there because it was unowned and of, un, of no other interest to anybody else. As that city encroaches, as that city grows, as more people need that common resource, um, and we all depend on it for our very lives, of course, until we can persuade Musk to get on top of one of his rockets. Mm -hmm. At that point, as those services encroach and things like that, you are you start to become a bit of a holdout. So, you know, if you had a, a hundred thousand, well, I won't say a hundred thousand acre property because they, they, they wouldn't happen in a in a freed market because you simply wouldn't have the resource without coercing someone else to help you um, to, to go and fence it off. But if you had a, a homesteaded small holding and were determined to hold on to it as the city grew around you, you would then, at least on paper, be gaining substantially without doing any work because... Because the more city and more grows people up would around be, you? Yeah, yeah. 
and there's and there would be services so you'd be hard prepared i mean you could live a hermit life in your yeah, i mean it acre. depends what you value a little bit which is what i keep running up against yeah there's a lot of services say in new york city that you use to depend on, but not everybody wants to live there. We obviously need farmland to keep everyone else going. So, Sure, but if you didn't want to live in the middle of a growing city, then the last thing you would want to do is to hold on to your one acre homestead as the suburb grows around you and and annoying people start to walk Where am past I going your then? fence, you know. So Where can then I go? you go and so that's how homestead homesteading, you know, you move on to the next sort of place, you know. Yeah. Pe- people who really don't want to be uh, in urban life, they they move on out, you know. Um so yeah, I can see that, you know, homesteading as the basis of how property originally becomes somebody's comes into someone's control let's say i i don't want to say ownership because although it is ownership but to me ownership means control of how it gets disposed of and what you're allowed and what people can do on it and and things like that it, it's not about being able to use that to harm others in other words if you have a I mean, I'm building some houses on the outskirts of Oxford on half an acre. So I'm getting eight units on on eight flats on half an acre, uh, eight apartments on on half an acre. And so those people, if I'm excluding those people and not doing anything commensurately productive with my land in the middle of the city than stopping other people using it, then I should bloody pay for it. You know, I should compensate the community for making the land around me ever so slightly more expensive by making a you know by by removing mine from the supply pool kind of thing right I see. and that th- there is this i've never really quite got to the bottom of what he meant by it but but henry george had this value system um instead of the labor theory of value uh, he used to call it the obligation theory of value so it was a reciprocal thing. As uh, if you used common monopoly resources, i.e., land in principle, then you needed to pay the community around you for removing their option to be able to use it. You know, so from Locke's position, you know, God gave the earth to all mankind in common. Nobody expects there to be some kind of system of dividing up the land into. You know, 8.9 billion little pieces and, and saying you, you, you all have a, an interest here. But the interest that we share is the rent that gets generated as communities come together and grow. So in a homesteaded situation, there is no rent. Nobody else wants that land. It's not scarce. Until people start to encroach around you and that becomes part of what people are squeezing up to try and avoid, if you like, then you're not affecting them. You know, you're not, you, you, you know, there is no rent due. If, if you were to abandon that piece of land or if you were to try and dispose of it to someone else, there's no value for them to pay you for it. They're, they're, you're getting control of, of its eventual disposal and and what you use it for and things like that but you're not getting any value for it because it's not generating value as land um sure what you do there if you're productive you might have a software house or you might have a farm Mm -hmm. and they will produce differing amounts of wealth but the one thing they won't do in isolation while nobody else needs that land is change the value of that land (laughs) you know as a as a location because there are, you know, millions of locations around you that are competing with you. You know, you are, right. you are what economists would call beyond the margin of production. There are no competing interests that 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 would enable someone to charge rent on that land. Well, one of the things I looked up before this was what I believe turned out to be an ANCAP, even a Mises guy, I think, critique of Georgism as he saw it. And one of the things was that there was no difference in if you arrive earlier or later sort of 
gosh, what's the term? <laughs> Late comers and and yeah. Well, well, as I say, I, I mean, I, I suppose you know when you when you look at how someone like um, Murray Rothbard wrote about it. I mean, he again treated America as being different from what he called the latifundia countries. You know, the South American countries completely dominated by colonial conquest and divided into big estates given out to you know the duke of corbido or cordoba or, or something far away and for him some of that land continued america was never feudal that was what he was getting at right. whereas a lot of europe was feudal and so the original feudal rents if they were still in the same family, are still a problem. Right, right. So he kind of got close to understanding why rent was an issue. But at that point, he kind of said, well, once the first transaction has happened, once it's become alienated from the people who were originally gifted it, if you like, or, or mm-hmm. conquered it, then it's just part of my market transactions. And so, you know, if it's gone up mm-hmm. since the last person moved in then the newcomer just has to pay more you know, that's that's how the market works but he he kind of missed the point that 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 rent isn't so all land value is rent if you if you if you think about it this way and this is key to understanding georgism or the single tax quite a lot the three factors of production land capital and wages and and labor have three different streams of revenue so wages interest on capital or in most cases we'd call it profit now mm-hmm. and rent on land so rent is the return on land and land values are today's estimation of the capitalized future value of all that rent so if i'm um you know in a in a in a system where uh, all of that rent was collected by the community, then the upfront cost of acquiring land would be zero. But the obligation from then on to carry on paying the rent might be very high in central London and very low in central Wyoming. Right. Uh, you know, nothing right. in central Wyoming. <laughs> so uh, we kind of, we ought to get away from calling it land value tax because that gets people into all sorts of strange arguments about you know if you if you tax something it disappears so what happens when you get to zero land value well of course the value of land is the value that it gives you this year it's like the interest rate on your bank account so the rental mm-hmm. income from land is the real value in land and it's it's very precisely uh attuned to economic success and failure and supply and demand and so on. So whereas at the moment, if you want to buy a piece of land, you're taking a a 20 or 25 year guess about what might happen in that area over the next 25 years and whether you will be paying too much now because the net future value of that will have fallen instead of gone and up you know and things like that whereas we're under a, a, a land value tax system you'd be paying nothing up front you'd be gambling nothing you wouldn't be borrowing from a bank well obviously you might still want to borrow from the bank to pay for the buildings that someone had put on that land um, but in terms of the, the the ground on which it sits it would all be I want to say least from the community, but but that's exactly what Henry George was trying to get away from. He did not talk about it in terms of nationalization of land. It was nationalization. It was socializing the rent of land. So you still have private ownership. You still have the right to determine how you dispose of it, how you use it, things like that. But the rent, which you don't create the community has created in millions of different ways, whether it's the fact that there's a bus running along the end of the street, which gives it value, or whether there's a government, a very good government school around the corner. You can track all of these factors in 
things like Zillow and Zoopla and see how they affect land values. And in fact, we have a problem here. You know, the the the, the way of rationing school places has generally been geographically around a, a particular school. So if one local school is really good, house prices in that area will rise. And you as a resident of that area have done absolutely nothing to merit that rise. Sure. It's the school, it's the teachers, it's the government who puts money into it or whatever. And so you, the, the idea of the single tax or land value tax is more about sharing the rent with the people who who actually are involved in creating it. The two two of the more dire interpretations of that, and perhaps it's totally off, is that to some people it might sound like, you know, the the ultimate homeowners association and all of these sort of crushing obligation to do certain things with your land. Or just in general that it would sort of inherently lead to some sort of stagnation where everything needs to be sort of coordinated and talked through to a fatal extent. I know that you have the land, but just when you talk so much about the surrounding everyone else inferring, giving the value to the land, sort of implies a inescapable obligation that I think some people well, find troubling. Well, not really. I, I think uh, I had listened to, to, to one of, in fact, it might have been that very first talk about the errors, is it the, the, the errors of liberal democracy or something he, uh, he, he talks about. Um, and one of them is, you know, in a, how, how do you apportion the, the, the various interests? You know, right. do you, do you prevent anyone doing anything until right. everybody has voted on it? You know, and that right. kind of thing. No, no, no. Now, I guess there is a discussion to be had about what your community is. But in practice, for instance, in Oxford, one of the problems we have is people, we are um, 60 minutes by train or by um, motor coach uh, into London. So people who are feeling the pinch in London, feeling the house price pinch in London, do come out to Oxford and are willing to bear the 60-minute commute. And, of course, that may have got even worse now with working from home being more popular. I mean, you could sit there and chart on a map the annual rail season tickets and the land values and see that they are in direct relation to each other. So as the as the length of the journey rises and the cost of the fare rises, so the price of the house falls so you can see that is a rent that is being captured kind of thing as you move closer to the city so you know oxford is quite clearly within the margins of production of somewhere huge like london and actually there probably isn't a place in the uk that you can say is is out of the influence in london you know it's kind of britain is what about physically about the size of New York State or something like that with 65 million people in it against 20 million at your end, you would definitely say that New York City dominates economically and in many other ways New York State, just as London economically dominates the entire UK and probably much further afield. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it, but it's really a very technocratic calculation it is much i mean the simplest way to do it w w would be to say well let's collect all the rent and then everyone within the area where we're collecting rent from gets an equal share of what we've collected and there's no government services you know everything is everything is then organized voluntarily locally collaboratively however you want to do it you could set up a local parish council to spend some of it you know but it would be done in that kind of a democratic way and so it would be a purely technical transaction between where london influences collecting that rent and then distributing it so actually someone in the north of scotland might make a big profit by this because they would be paying very little rent because you know, they're 700 miles away and very remote with few services. So their land is worth almost nothing mm -hmm. compared with someone in the middle of London who would be paying a lot of grand rent, but they'd both be receiving the same share of the dividend, a bit like the Alaska dividend. 
but anyway, I mean that, that 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 we can dream about that. You know, for most people, Georgism is about a way to raise the revenue that they want a government to spend. I just argue with them about what size and what shape that government should be, whether it should be more or less formal or or not at all. It starts to sound like um, kind of a panacea when I've when I've seen um, George just talk about it. You know, all those other income and uh, value added taxes. There are you know that they're they're a big problem, and and land value tax will sort of fix everything. I think if there was a a, a straw man of your argument, I suppose that would be it. Well. There are some things that people think are bad words. You know, ideology is one. Panacea mm. is another. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, if there is a silver bullet, then why not acknowledge it? I mean, part of the thing is that, as economists like David Ricardo showed, the relationship between how much an owner can charge in rent and what a land what a piece of land can produce is 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 a pretty fundamental economic rule and so is the idea that when you tax something you reduce people's propensity to do that thing so whether that you know right. so if it's highly taxing work then people start to not bother to do the extra overtime because they're just going to get pennies in the pound for it because they're being taxed you know so land is so immutable and and in george's sense i mean obviously george was perhaps writing at a time when well he was writing at a time when we didn't know anything about space or the electromagnetic spectrum or all sorts of other natural phenomena that are kind of monopolistic but by far the biggest is still land Everyone needs land. Every living creature needs land. Even in, even the birds need land because they need to land sometime. Even if you live on a sailboat, you've still got to have somewhere to be able to tie up to go to the provisions. Sure, store. that's true. You know, even if you're permanently on the International Space Station, you've got to have somewhere where from where Elon can send a Red Cross parcel every so often. So all life needs land and as we uh, in particular humans are more and more of us on the planet then we're more likely to encroach and we're more likely to find benefits in mixing with people um, and that's why urbanization has been such a a great thing um and therefore that land land values have always trended with economic activity mm -hmm. so it, it, the, the, it's almost a, a from what how i would describe it is a sort of economic law of gravity and you wouldn't expect any physicist to propose something as daft as 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 ignoring the laws of gravity when when they're building a, a theory and it's the same with a tax system why why, why would you ignore the most basic relationship between land that we need to live on and its productivity being nothing to do with the people who own it and yet accruing to those people that value is accruing to those people and they are in the process putting added impositions on the people who use that land so if you're a budding entrepreneur first of all you've got to add you've got to factor in the fact that you know governments want to take 35% of all your labor, all your workers' earnings. They want mm -hmm. to take 30% of all your profits. And then someone else called your landlord wants to take another slice, and this time for doing nothing. At least, at least you've got the pretense of being able to look at government and say, oh, well, they produce this, that, and the other. You know, they give us services and, you know, of dubious benefit, admittedly. But the landlord has done nothing for that location they may have produced a building and it's right that you know it's right that if you're occupying that building you should be paying that put the person who put that building together for the use of it um, but that's a whole lot different from paying them the value that the community has created in that location 
And so once you remove that value by taxing it away, you don't need to tax incomes. You don't need to tax capitals. Henry George was very specific, for example, about what was wealth. Wealth he wouldn't tax. Land isn't wealth. Financial capital isn't wealth. They are claims on other people's wealth. Whereas the things you produce but don't consume, if you like, that becomes wealth. And so you don't want to you don't want to tax that. Like like some people quite vaguely say, let's have a wealth tax. And you know what they mean. They generally mean people with lots of stocks and shares or people with a Picasso or people with a Ferrari. Well, if they have earned that Ferrari somehow by honest means, and I probably dispute that, you know, £100,000 is, is worthwhile spending on a, a, a vehicle given normal compensation for work. I mean, most of that is probably rent in some form or another. I mean, I guess if it's not, <laughs> it's not so popular, but... um. Again, I saw something YouTubing about Georgism. I saw a claim that economists from Friedman to, to Keynes both thought the land value tax was a good idea. And yet I feel like almost nobody talks about it and almost nobody suggests it at this point. And... Well, Keynes is an interesting one because I, I, I've never actually found where he did talk about it. He did. He, there is a sec, There is a passage... I think it's actually a footnote in something, but he talks about euthanizing the rentier class. And that's fine, but he's not specific about okay. land value tax, which is which is kind of odd because Keynes was a British liberal and the British Liberal Party was steeped in land reform and for 30 years or so land taxes. Maybe not when his general theory was written but it would only i mean the the same people would still have been around who advocated strongly for it so it's quite odd that he misses it out especially since he he does spend quite a lot of time talking about taxes but definitely friedman friedman was a big fan of henry george i read the other day he, he described one of other one of henry george's other books um protection or free trade as being one of the greatest books ever written about free trade. Okay, that's intriguing. And the thesis there is basically that free trade cannot happen while while you've got a government deciding how much of people's earnings to take, because that's uh, that's like a tariff. That's like an internally imposed tariff on production. And so the only fair way of doing it is to do it by land values and let people's productive capacities flourish as 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 they as they will and then then you can have genuinely free trade you don't need i mean in, in george's time obviously the biggest tax that affected the ordinary working man were tariffs in in the form of increasing prices for goods which american industry and the robber barons wanted to produce and sell at monopoly rates whereas they could have imported stuff without tariff and saved the working man a lot of money in taxes, that kind of thing. So it's a very indirect way of taxing, but it was the biggest form, and in, in Britain. And it's always very interesting to me to see how, you know, these days in Britain and in America, it's the political right, uh, the conservatives here, for example, who are thought to be the party of free enterprise the party of free trade in america that used to be our thing and in the last five or six years yeah. a lot more protectionist paleo i would call paleo conservatism or but we used to do the whole ronald reagan fake free trade thing a lot yeah. more yeah yeah that well people here still say oh you know you're a businessman you understand free trade you must vote conservative and that thinks so. <laughs> and of course this is only something that's 50 years old i mean i know that's a long time in politics because you know most of your voters are younger than that and don't remember anything different but but for most of their existence the conservative party has been the party of supporting the business interests that in turn supported them politically mm -hmm. and so you know the corn laws in britain were about getting tory landowners to vote conservative to keep voting conservative kind of thing and right up until the end of the 19th century the early english socialist movement was being led by people singing anti-tariff songs 
And so the real free mm. traders, in fact, that book, Protection versus Protection or Free Trade by Henry George, a 1930-something edition of that had an introduction penned by the then Labour Party Chancellor of the Exchequer. And all this was in the context of a time when the Tories wanted to reintroduce tariffs right up until the Second World War and beyond, slightly. So it's, you know, there's that big political amnesia, uh, uh, if you like, about where some of these ideas came from. You know, free trade was a left position, as far as I'm concerned. It was about voluntary exchange with the worker around the world, you know. Do you think that's true in from what you know about um, America? Because maybe on a more basic level, I associate a lot of leftist... Either you get sort of a mid... A very mid leftist like Bernie Sanders, who kind of isn't partial to immigration, which to me is a part of free trade. Yeah. And I mean, it's all about protecting the worker. They t- that's the way they spin it. And yeah, I- I'm big friends with his brother. Well, sort of. He- he's a colleague. He's a fellow work fellow director, or he was a fellow director of the Community Land Trust. I was talking about. I wrote about and I did berate him where in in the last election when he started going on about you know agreeing with building the wall kind of thing or or at least keeping yeah yeah I mean sometimes here I thought of Bernie Sanders as the much nicer sounding Donald Trump who manages to sort of try to sell that isolation protectionist mentality without sounding quite like it's only about a hatred of Mexicans but it's certainly a lot closer than um you know, your average Sanders supporter would ever like to admit, I think. Yeah, I, I, I mean, partly where I got that from, I go back to Clarence Lee Swartz. I mean, the introduction to what is mutualism, and Henry George, of course, talk a lot about how protectionism affects the ordinary working man, consumer, working person in America as mm-hmm. compared with the bosses um, and the owners of capital who benefit from having their prices kept high by protectionism. Now, of course, I suppose in a bigger world economy, you can say, well, nowadays every industry is so internationally sourced that, that it's difficult to say whether does America want to make all its steel or is it is it better for the for the economy anyway to simply buy steel from there and then manufacture nice things with it in america that that kind of you know that kind of interconnectedness is has changed the landscape a little bit but you know in terms of i mean there's a a cambridge economist uh left-wing economist called harjun chang um he's korean and one of the things i remember him writing in particular was so one of the great british free traders was richard cobden in the 19th century a liberal mp and so on and a campaigner against the corn laws and um harjun chang argues that cobden wanted free trade in order to make sure that britain's emerging industrial powerhouse kept its advantage and germany and the united states stayed poor agricultural economies now that's another way of thinking of it you know if you want free trade and you want to be able to buy your corn from america you're going to encourage americans to produce corn and not to produce higher value goods whereas britain is producing the higher value goods certainly free trade started as a ground level you know the working consumer type person's interest rather than the bosses and now yeah it kind of is or should be but i guess it's another thing that's been sort of sullied free trade agreements you know that kind of thing that's not yeah really and now we think of looking for and now we think of you know nike getting trainers from somewhere far away for 98 cents and selling them for 99 dollars or right. or whatever and being able to profit from that rent kind of thing we, we haven't been very structured have we <laughs> perhaps not uh, i've never been accused of being structured in my life so um uh, we, we we have kind of covered quite a lot of what, what was in here i'm still trying to suss out sort of and i hate to cite and caps though god knows you cited more than i expected um there's some definitional dislike 
of the way I think Georgists look at land. Because I'm sure an ANCAP would admit that land is finite and more finite you know, than any other property they can think of. But they still look at it as property nonetheless. And sort of there's the homesteading thing trying to deal with that. But they sort of shrug about it, I think, because it's property like anything else in the world. Yeah, but it's property. I mean, if it were a Picasso, I mean, okay, there would be public interest in being able to view <laughs> this very rare piece of art but it, essentially right. n nobody else needs that piece of art mm. you, you, you know it, nobody's going to die without it whereas land is contingent on me recognizing that for a start me recognizing your occupancy of that now of mm. course a thousand miles in the outback or in deepest idaho nobody quite cares because you know you're out of sight and especially in a land value tax area where essentially all the rent would be much more concentrated in urban areas and there would be a great amount of land for homesteading in america huge amount of land for homesteading right. in america so anybody who wanted to live completely free could probably get away with it right in britain it would be different because so much you know Still, 1% of the population own physically 70% of the land by acreage, for example. You know, so there's still a problem there. Okay. But, but um, yeah, it's when you start butting up against other people um, that you've either got to decide, do I have some obligations to these other people or am I just somehow allowed with no repercussions, remember, because this is an anarchy and reputation is important and, and what's the word for um, ostracizing people? Can't say I understand that reference. But I'm yeah, intrigued. well, for some reason, we, <laughs> we send people to Coventry. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so ostracizing and reputation are, 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 are quite important characteristics, you know, especially when you start complaining about the Chinese social whatever it is, social credit system. Little do they know that social credit was a Canadian thing, of course, a um, hundred years ago. In fact, uh, Victor, um, British Columbia and Alberta were, were, were governed by social credit parties for, for many years. If you're going to be a holdout and try and keep your homestead pristine as other people encroach, <sighs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, at that point, you start to have to wonder, well, if I step outside my door, I'm going to have to pay the road owner who's provided all these services. Right. You know, and, and is it worth me doing that? I, am I being productive with this piece of land? Or, you know, has, has the city changed its um, productive value? It's no longer good as a farm because it's noisy. I can't keep animals. There's a bit of pollution. You know, the crops aren't doing the best and so on i might as well leave here and if i want to farm i can go further further out in idaho and start all again there's a lovely dire straits you know dire straits of band british band telegraph road if you listen to the words of telegraph road it's a georgist song you know the guy comes along as a homesteader sets down his load where he thought it was the best made a home in the wilderness and then by the end, there's six lanes of traffic or 12 lanes of traffic, six lanes moving slow. I see. At some point, something's got to give there. And I don't really, I don't really see a problem because as soon as, as soon as the services that those, that makes those cities valuable starts to encroach on your homesteaded place, you're either going to have to use those facilities and pay for them, in which case you're going to have to be more productive than a farm would be in order to justify it, in order in order to pay for that, or you're going to move on and homestead somewhere else and farm somewhere else. Now there is, a, you know, there, there are you know, what what happens at that margin? Uh, can someone come along and suddenly say, "Well, you owe us." x in land value tax well this is why actually i think it would be better in an anarchist society than a government society because nobody's coming along and saying you owe us this we are the tax man we are the man you can come and you pay us at least in the anarchist society they have the choice to say 
well, thanks. I don't want your protection. I don't want your roads. I'm just going to sit here and barricade myself in and not pay you anything. But actually, you're going to be quite miserable. You are. Yeah. So, uh, so at some point, you're that's gonna... your prerogative. Yeah, I would like to it's think. your prerogative. That's not. It's pretty self defeating. <laughs> and there may be some way of you know, but but then it wouldn't be coercive taxation in the sense you know, using the road outside would be voluntary. Using the services and paying the land tax, if you like, in your shopping bill by going to the mall would be voluntary. It's what happens just to your little patch. And I guess that's that's an issue. But it's a small issue in the scheme of things. After all you've just said, I'm going to compare it first to universal basic income. I'm not known for advocating for, but it's very hard for me to picture that it could be worse than the current situation and certainly if you removed you know god knows how many jobs and bureaucratic departments and you just said here's some money i mean that would be there's no way that's worse so is all of what you just said your ideal or is it you know your pragmatic conclusion well i mean ultimately Henry George is not about a UBI. Lots of people now think, oh, would, you know, actually they're thinking, oh, UBI might be a bit expensive. We need to find a new a new way of taxing to get some more money for it. And oh, look, right, there's land yeah. taxes. But actually, you know, as I said, Henry George was quite happy with the state funding capital projects and things like that, and and then giving giving away any surplus over and above that which they collected in tax as a dividend. Now, there's a, an importance, in my mind, there's an important difference between a citizen's dividend and a universal basic income in that in the case of a universal basic income, some politicians sit down and say, what should this be now? How do we fund it? Whereas a citizen's dividend is like the Alaska dividend. How much is left, uh, left over? What's the profit between land value collection and or land rents and government expenditure now split that surplus equally right it is truly a dividend you don't know you can't rely on it as a way of living Mm. and actually if you read his most important or most popular piece of work progress and poverty the first half of the book is about the general structure of production and where money goes to and why why we don't need capitalists for example Mm. So he's very much a labor-oriented guy. And the land or the ability to extract rent from others for, for somewhere that you don't occupy is at the very root of leaching out you know, the earnings of others because they're faced with no choice. They have to rent somewhere. They have to pay for somewhere to live, which amounts to rent now or rent in a mortgage kind mm-hmm. of thing. And they're faced with these taxes on top of that. So that's double the costs, whereas you could have a a land tax system where the government is taking the rent and and not having any of your earnings. And so it is the very act of taxing the land that frees up money from production to go back to its producer, to the labor producer. And so there would be much less need for welfare. It's the same libertarian argument about an absolute free market. Won't, there won't be poor in a free market because in reality, everyone finds their level and some everyone is worth something, even if it's relatively less than the next guy. You know? And so some people think, well, it would be great. The most libertarian form of land value tax would be to turn it all around, take away the government and say, Here, every household is your individual check for your equal share population proportion of the tax collected. Do what you like with it. If your locality wants to have a a local authority council that wants to take some of that money, then you can vote for it and you can vote for how much money of your dividend they can have um, and thereby create some kind of communitarian collaborative investor who's putting in money into the roads and the school and things like that or everybody can take their dividend check and pay for those services privately Mm -hmm. Um, and and for some that would be 
the ultimate libertarian form of Georgism, single taxing. But right. you know, we've got to recognize that he wrote this that he wrote it in the era of strong government, um, albeit much smaller in terms of a proportion of the economy than today, mm -hmm. but still it, it was expected that government would, you know, maintain law and order, build the roads, you know, keep sanitation, things like that. And so I'm sure humanity can think of ways of spending that land rent income on good things for the community rather than giving it all to individuals, if you trust mm. politicians enough to do that. <laughs> My problem is that I don't, so I'd rather give the money all straight back, turn it around and let that economic incentive of, oh, do I move to a low tax area and collect the same dividend, so I'll be rich, or do I move to a high tax area and collect the same dividend and so pay more than I get? And on that question, depend or, or what what makes my productivity in each location makes that question important. You know, if by moving to central London, I can become a half a million pound a year lawyer, then it's obviously better for me to pay a hundred thousand pounds in land rent than it would be to for me to live somewhere where a lawyer gets twenty five thousand pounds a year defending drunks, kind of thing. And there's another problem, of course, you know, and another interest of mine, which we shouldn't go off on one. <laughs> Regulatory monopolies, you know, the legal system is all rent. The banking system is all rent. Sure. And if you extract that rent, if you think that when, when we pay income tax, we are paying the income tax of the shop that sold us something, we're paying the distributor's income tax, we're paying the producer's income tax, we're paying the raw material producer's income tax. Think how much that is adding on to the cost that we in the end pay. And you'll see how simply changing that tax system takes a huge lump of cost out of the system and makes everything so much cheaper and makes me able to live on a lot less money if necessary and still be comfortable. Because everything I buy now includes everyone else's taxes all the way to that point. Well, you've at least partially sold me, so hopefully that's enough. Um... There are so many better people who won't go off on <laughs> complete rambles. Okay, I gotta give you one more is the obligatory non-Servium question, which is how would I purchase a cappuccino in your political utopia? And it's how would I do it in case you don't want a cappuccino? I want a cappuccino. How do I get one in this society? Well, I mean, it's a, as far as I can see, it's the ultimate freed market. I mean, I don't see why it would be any different, except it would probably be quite a lot cheaper mm -hmm. because for a start, the milk and the coffee beans are both land, directly land dependent. So, you know, removing the, feudal rent that so many people still pay in rural areas in, in, in Britain, for example, maybe not in America, but 50% of farming is tenanted farming. So they are paying government taxes and rents to a landlord. So they would have one of those gone completely. So your coffee beans or your... Um, uh, you'd also probably... The logical way of working a, a land value tax is, is to call it a resource value tax. And you'd probably send some of that money back to Brazil or Rwanda or Ethiopia in the form of a, a you know, international development because you're, you're extracting from their land. Um, mm -hmm. So, you'd, you know, you, you, you might be paying some of that. Um, so it would, it would create a virtuous circle in terms of international development. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, but other than that, you know, your your barista would be either earning a third more or costing the coffee shop a third less because you're not paying the taxes on him. Mm -hmm. The property, now remember, a lot of these big chains, you know, Starbucks or Costa's, McDonald's famously, are landowners. They're not burger makers, they're landowners, mm -hmm. right? So they thrive on the control of the land. So actually what you're much more likely to get is the ability of me to start a, you know, Kevin Carson's home homebrew industrial revolution. You're much more likely to for me to be able to afford to set up a coffee shop in my front room and get a decent one instead of a Starbucks one. <laughs> 
and what interesting competition and variety yeah. of uh, consumer goods might result from that. So yeah. That's and nice. perfection, of course, because it would be full of enthusiasts, not people having to, not people having to work to pay the rent. Oh, that, that's a, that's a good note. Yeah. Uh, that's a good note. But also how, where can the good people who are listening find you on the internet? We sell yourself here. Yeah. Well, as I say, I had, I had kind of given up on, uh, you know, life is passing by and, and, and some people get to the point of being an old man trying to get things done more quickly. And some think, you know, I've taken the view that I wasn't as being as influential as I could possibly be anyway. So let's not bother. Generally speaking, if you look for Jock O X three J O C K O X digit three, mo that's my username on most social media. So, Facebook, Mastodon, Twitter for now, anyway. <laughs> um, so say we all. Yeah, and also on those platforms. So I'd be medium dot com slash Jock O X three or whatever, or Jock dot Coats in a few cases if they didn't like if Jock O X three wasn't long enough or something like that. But I will now try and put some effort in. I've been very lazy. Um, you know, it would be nice to be as prolific as someone like Kevin or Charles Johnson or, or something like that. But when you don't have an audience, you know, when you look up the audience statistics and say 30 people read your last post, you think, what's the point? All too relatable. But I will try and um, get things going again. Because today has given me lots to, lots to think about. That's good. Well, John, thank you very much for coming along. No, thank you. It's been very enjoyable. Yes. listening to the non-Servian podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much. <laughs>